let's set the stage. You're at a huge event hosted by none other than the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Everyone is all dressed up, you're wearing your finest, and walking through the exhibits just drinking in the absolute beauty and history of all of the art around you. Guests stop and stare at Renaissance oil paintings and ancient pottery, nodding their approval and expressing their admiration to one another. You pass a group of uppity looking older folks and you can't help but overhear that they're gushing about the absolutely stunning piece available for display in the men's bathroom. They can't fathom why the museum would hide away such a brilliant piece. Finally, you decide you have to go and see for yourself. You make your way to the bathroom, push open the door, and see a crowd has already formed. It's an original? A portrait maybe? Maybe a sculpture? You knock elbows with several exceptionally fancy looking men to get inside and finally get a peek at it. And it's a urinal. Crowds of people are forming a small audience just ooing and eyeing at a urinal. Whispers from the crowd call it brave, striking, even beautiful. It doesn't make any sense. Surely this urinal can't be considered art, right? Well, wrong. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 3 of Archiversy. When I uploaded my first episode at the beginning of November, I said I would be making at least 3 episodes to see how the project went. From here, I'm really not sure where the show will go, or I guess if it will go, but I really wanted to sort of explore the full range of what this show could be in these 3 episodes. Episode 1, I discussed the dark history behind the works of the famous oil painter Artemisia Gentileschi. Episode 2 focused more on the controversy surrounding the topic of tracing in the art world, specifically pulling on an example from Butch Hartman this past year, and now we're going to see how those ideas can blend together. Today, we're going to get a little bit of art history and a little bit of modern controversy. We are discussing Marcel Duchamp and his infamous artwork, The Fountain. Don't forget to keep leaving any feedback or topic suggestions in the comments, or I guess just send them to me on Twitter. That is Briey, like DIY, but B R I E, uh, like the French cheese. <laughs> Speaking of the French, our local artist Marcel Duchamp was in fact a French artist who worked in multiple styles and multiple mediums, including chess, weirdly enough, that might be a, considered an art form. How intellectual. <laughs> Duchamp was born in France in the late 1800s, 1887 to be exact, on July 28th, which is incidentally my fiance's birthday. This of course makes him a Leo, which honestly makes a whole lot of sense to me. This whole story just screams Leo energy to me. Oftentimes we imagine artists as highly creative and super right-brained, but Duchamp challenged this stereotype by being an outstanding academic, specifically in math. In spite of his success in academics, though, he dedicated so much of his life to painting. He was even said to skip classes to play billiards instead with his art friends. <laughs> His early works fell predominantly in the post-impressionist movement, focusing greatly on symbolism and sort of less realistic qualities. This style is particularly abstract, which certainly aligns with many, many of his works. His paintings often depict movement through the repetition of shapes, almost like uh, a motion blur in animation. Truly, I think the best way I can describe his work is illusion paintings, kind of where you have to stand back really far and maybe like cross your eyes or squint them a little bit to kind of see the picture. I actually set my laptop up across the room and backed all the way up uh, just to kind of interpret a lot of his works. And I'm still not 100% on what I'm seeing a lot of the time since it is so abstract. But keep in mind, I am an English teacher, not a proper art critic, so I don't really know what I'm doing. But I think there's a lot to be said about how interpretation varies from person to person and how experience can dictate how we interact with art. But that could easily be a whole other topic. Duchamp did spend some involuntary time in the military in 1905, and by 1908 he was exhibited in the annual Salon d'Automne, pardon my French, I'm really trying, um, and he was actually beside some really well-known artists, although some of them did actually call his work particularly ugly. 
Uh, from this, he made some excellent connections. He started building his own reputation, and he often described his own work as stretched out as if elastic, which I think is like a really neat way to describe it. Though he initially seemed to resist the cubist movement, which was heavily emerging at the time, very popular, um, I would say a lot of his work sort of began to take on this cubist quality, which is described as showing multiple different views of the same subject in the same picture, and it sort of gives it like a broken appearance. Like it looks somewhat incomplete or cracked. However, he was politely asked to withdraw a painting after submitting a piece to the Cubist exhibition. The work was entitled Nude Descending a Staircase Number 2, which depicted what could be considered a Cubist interpretation of a nude, and of course that nude was then descending a staircase. <laughs> The reason behind his being asked to withdraw was not a question of its quality, but whether or not it was actually considered a cubist work, which is a fun question to ask. <laughs> Duchamp himself described the event as a turning point in his life in which he turned away from artist groups. By 1913, he was done altogether, and he actually became a librarian, mad respect. Though in reading, he did in this time sort of begin to understand that the criticism of one's art isn't necessarily truth, and he took that to heart. He began experimenting with art science, blending his two talents together, his academics and his love of creativity. And here is where he really began to start at the beginning of his controversy. Duchamp was known to create works entitled ready-mades, and this concept of a ready-made is it's really simple actually, you just take original objects and modify them or position them in a certain way and then boom, it's art. Uh, Duchamp actually considered his art more of a visual medium so art can impact the mind. One of the first ready-mades he actually made was a bicycle mounted upside down on top of a stool. Simple, yet effective. And while Duchamp said that he originally created it to quote, build atmosphere, uh, he later said that he really enjoyed watching it just spin around and around and every so often he would spin it just to experience the art. After a while, he grew quite tired of France, and having experienced success born out of the small controversy with New Descending a Staircase Number 2, he emigrated to the U.S. in 1915. For context, historically speaking, we're within the time frame of World War I. This was, of course, a tense time in history. The horror and the deep-seated negativity that the war caused prompted many extreme reactions, and one of these was a new art style that focused a lot on complete nonsense and irrationality. This of course is called Dadaism, or simply Dada. Uh, the artists involved really wanted to like promote their anti-war politics by completely disregarding what the standards of art were considered, uh, and this way of operating against the constructs of art sort of created a new construct of art. Duchamp was a prominent member of the art world in the U.S., helping to found a new group entitled the American Society of Independent Artists in New York. The purpose, of course, was simply to create some place where artists could share their work. It was as simple as that. There's no judgment and no one was rewarded for being better than other, no, no trophies, no uh, mentions. In essence, it's kind of just like an open mic night. At the time, it cost $6 to submit a work to the gallery, which would be close to about $130 today. And that was it. As long as you paid, you got in. That was the only criteria. Works were hung alphabetically by last name, which kept things relatively fair and equal. Duchamp was sick and tired of being judged and having to be deemed good enough in order to make it into those exhibitions. So the idea of sharing art without first having it deemed valuable by the masses was really desirable, especially after all of the experiences that he had had in Europe. Though so finally, the first exhibition is approaching and Duchamp submits his piece anonymously. Um, he satirically entitled it The Fountain, a ready-made, but it wasn't just a plain old ready-made, it was a urinal, a store-bought urinal laid on its side and signed with the pseudonym R. Mutt. And much to his surprise, the board of directors on this society said no. Their reasoning? The urinal was indecent and certainly wasn't a piece of art. In truth, because the entrance fee was paid, it wasn't exactly possible to reject the work, but they certainly did try to hide it. Duchamp noted that it was placed behind a partition, and although he was part of the board of directors, even he didn't know where it was during the showing. So once it was located, Duchamp made a point of ensuring that it was photographed, and 
it's a good thing that it was, because not long after this event, the piece had kind of mysteriously gone missing. Nobody really knows what happened to it. Some people will note that some images taken in Duchamp's studio featured a urinal hanging in the doorway. Um, some speculate that this was, in fact, the fountain, recognizing that there was little reason for Duchamp to have more than one urinal. Um, I, however, firmly believe that this man would 100% have more than one urinal on hand. I mean, come on. <laughs> With the rise of Dada, there was a notable amount of disagreement with the decision to censor the piece. The fact that it was hidden during the showing made it through the grapevine in the art community. A Dadaist magazine actually shared the news of the refusal comparing the form of the urinal to other well-known pieces and even going as far as to call out those who said that the piece was not art. Specifically, it claimed that the fountain was not made by a plumber, but by the force of an imagination. Because of Dadaism's adherence to the idea that traditional art isn't the only art, they lamented that it was the idea behind the piece that mattered, just like the ugly macaroni necklaces that your kids bring home to you after church camp. <laughs> the magazine further asserted that a urinal can't be considered indecent or immoral as the society claimed because they're an everyday fixture and whether or not a urinal was handcrafted was irrelevant because it was chosen by the artist and for that it had significance. It was interpreted as a claim that a useful object just by changing the orientation had now become useless. At this time, Duchamp was still not publicly known to be the artist. He was able to effectively test how open the society would be to unique forms of art and truly be a safe space for artists to share their work and really everything that they're passionate about. The artist, R. Mutt, was being scrutinized but also heavily praised. Duchamp's motivation behind the use of the name R. Mutt differs between sources. Some say that the word is a pun on the German word Armut, meaning poverty. Others will say it's the name of a cartoon character or even a play on the company Mott Works, uh, which actually manufactures sanitary equipment, much like urinals. Regardless of the reason, Duchamp chose to sign under a pseudonym to avoid any favor from his colleagues. Though he had suspicions that the society may have discovered the true identity of R. Mutt, and then left the Society of Artists after the dishonesty and the clear disregard for the mission of the organization. One anonymous author even commented that the idea of the urinal being considered immoral is absurd. They questioned how such an everyday object could be considered immoral. By the time the 1920s had begun, many believed Duchamp had completely abandoned art, and he wanted to focus solely on his competitive chess career. He actually reappeared in 1934, in which he produced a portable museum with miniatures of some of his favorite works. He entitled this the Box in the Valise, Box in a Valise, which is probably the cutest thing I've ever seen. You guys need to look at those pictures. Um, he began creating replicas of the fountain, kind of in an attempt to show his works to a wider audience. Some did question the authenticity of the art of the ready-made if it is a recreation. And if it's not any intentional choices in a particular moment, does that make it the same thing as the original piece? This, of course, opens up a whole other idea of which urinals can be considered art based on the principles of Dadaism. It seems so ironic given the fact that it's basically the art equivalent of saying the rules are there are no rules, and yet there's rules. <laughs> Duchamp's piece was considered intentionally disruptive. It made huge ripple effects in the art community and it challenged the idea of what art was supposed to be or look like. Though even after this huge bookmark in art history, the idea to the public of what art seems to be remains the same. Postmodern art rests in the ideal of complexity and contradiction. There is no single point of view in art. The world is always changing, and what is considered art now might not be considered art later. And what might not have been considered art at the time of the fountain has now become a well-known staple in art history as the catalyst for postmodern art to thrive. So now for me to impart my two cents upon the topic. What qualifies as art? As I write these scripts and I consider all of the possible topics, I'm constantly reminded of my art history class that I took in college. It was hands down my favorite class that I've 
probably ever taken and it had one of my favorite professors shout out to you margaret but it was also a ridiculously hard class because of those same ideas surrounding change Art has grown and evolved over the course of history, and even just looking at the difference between the works in cartoonists and animators and realistic portraitists and even live paintings for weddings, these wildly opposing styles are still valued as art because we, as a society, place that value on them. In this class, we had to do projects at two different points, both of which involved creating art in the style and or form of a particular time period. And I will never forget the girl that did Dadaism as her project. It was a brilliant performance art piece. She stood in front of the classroom with this like large white canvas and she looked like she was about to paint, but instead she pulled a baby doll out of her bag and began to straight up dismembering it, both legs, both arms, you know, no more head, and piece by piece, she just took these like super long pins and started stabbing the appendages through the canvas so that they would like hang off like a creepy plastic baby doll mobile. <laughs> it was alarming, unexpected, and also unforgettable. I wonder constantly if everyone in my class thinks about that as much as I do. Her movements were so like direct, so powerful. She, it, she didn't rehearse it though, that's the wild part. She had a plan, but the execution was what felt right in the moment. And she did really well on that art project because simply put, she said it was art and so it was. <laughs> But that also makes me think about this other scene from the first season of Daredevil on Netflix. The like big mob boss guy, the Mr. Fisk, is talking with the a uh, museum curator lady about what appears to be just like a plain white on white canvas, vast and empty, nothing to be seen. And she makes this joke about how she always calls it the rabbit in a snowstorm. I always say polar bear in a snowstorm because you know it's it's a classic joke. More importantly, she comments that art isn't really about what you see. It's about how it makes you feel, and I think that's a weirdly well put comment. Now, I attempted a quick Google search on that to see if it was actually some sort of fancy, well-known quote from like Henry David Thoreau or someone else, but I couldn't really find it anywhere. Truthfully, I'm not certain that's even the exact quote, but I do think it does encapsulate art as a concept really well. I am by no means qualified to decide here and now what art is and isn't, or even provide a definitive definition because I really think it's, Im it's an impossible task. But I do think that the feelings are what makes art meaningful to us as individuals and as artists. I don't remember that piece the way it looks. I don't remember where the baby doll's head was in relation to its left arm, but I do remember the shock and the awe that I felt watching it come to life. I remember you know, crying, listening to For Good from Wicked for the first time when I saw it live. And I remember every frustrating line and groan and my feelings as I attempt to create the visions I have in my head when I draw because the vision in my head means something to me. And even publishing my first book of poetry, I was completely panicking over how my words might be misinterpreted or, you know, read or mean something completely different than I intended to a complete stranger who might pick it up on the street. And then I realized there is like such a beauty in that. Art is interactive, it's transactional, and we experience art, we don't just see it. It's more than just paint on a canvas. And once I accepted that, it became a lot more fun to create. I actually wrote a short form piece in my book about that same idea. I called it uh, Interpretations and it reads, what if the pencil markings blend into colors I didn't intend? That is just a risk I will have to take. My experience writing something may be wildly different than someone else reading it, but isn't that what makes art so freaking incredible? I mean, come on, one thing to me and something different to you, but the crazy thing is that it makes meaning. Plato once said something like, the offspring of painting stand there as if alive, but if you ask them a question, they maintain an aloof silence. And that's true, but that also means that the answer can be anything I want it to be. I'm not bound by the authorship. I am free to feel and respond and make meaning for myself, and creators are free to do the same. The expression can be just as powerful and meaningful as the reception, and it's not always about the end products. In a way, I wonder if our ideas about what is and isn't art are rooted in a sort of selfish idea that our feelings and ideas are true and correct. Society believed that the fountain was obscene, 
uh, but obviously not everyone did. So of course I wonder would the fountain have been as highly praised if it hadn't been as controversial or brave. <laughs> was the artistry in it that it was in and of itself challenging or was it the feelings of outrage over the censorship? Was it art because it made the society uncomfortable and facilitated change? Who's to say it's not all of those things together? Even now, as I look at Duchamp's fountain, I see a statement. It is certainly intentionally disruptive, and it makes me stop. It made me think, and certainly that's a part of what makes it so great. Perhaps the experience of creating the work itself and the performance of Duchamp as he flipped the original urinal and signed his name gave him a certain feeling. Perhaps it meant much more to him than we'll ever know only being able to look at a picture of the finished product. Realistically, this episode has probably asked more questions than it has answered. It's like a big pile of maybes and could be's with a dash of history, but damn, is that interesting? <laughs> Either way, I wanted to thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Feel free to leave a comment on the YouTube channel video, and that is Briey, B-R-I-E-I-Y, like DIY with Briegees. <laughs> or shoot me a tweet or DM on Twitter under the same name. Let me know what you think about the episode and also how does the fountain make you feel? I'm really interested to know. <laughs> Stay excellent, my artsy friends, and I will be seeing you in the next one. See ya.